Okay, here we go. All right, so good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tracy Paff Smith. I am the executive director of the Huntington Historical Society. The society was founded in 1903 and we work to preserve and share the history of the town of Huntington. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, we talked about the chat box already. Anyone new, if you would just find the, the chat box and that's where we're going to be asking questions. We're gonna answer questions at the end. You can ask throughout the talk, but please uh, know that they won't be answered till the end. So be very specific in your question. Don't say, what is pictured in the slide or is that still there because by the time we get to it at the end we're not going to be sure what you're talking about so just please be specific um, there are also different screen options and this varies depending on what kind of device you're on but if you would just take a moment to sort of toggle through so ideally you will see the slides large and then the speaker will be kind of in the corner and that will change depending on who's speaking, so you'll probably see me right now. There are other views where you can kind of see all participants, or you can see all three speakers. Um, and that is if you sort of hover towards the top of your screen, there should be options for different views. So just take a moment to play around with that and get the optimal view for yourself. Uh, you can answer, um, excuse me, ask questions in the chat box if you have any, and I'll do my best to try to help you out. All right, still admitting a couple people. Okay. Robert, if you don't mind advancing the slide. All right, so first and foremost, I want to thank the sponsors of today's virtual lunch and learn program, People's United Bank. They were sponsoring our in person lunch and learns at Red Restaurant, which, as we all know, got paused and remain on pause. So they very kindly agreed to keep sponsoring us in this new virtual format. So we're so happy to have their support and so grateful. And they are wonderful. Uh, there are branches all throughout Long Island and Stephen is on uh, today. So if you have any questions, you could reach out to him via the chat. Um, so thank you again, People's United Bank for your support. I also want to thank all of our members who are on. Membership is an annual contribution. It starts at $30 annually for senior level, $40 for an individual, and it provides critical unrestricted support for our education and outreach programs, our exhibitions, and the preservation of our properties and collections. So if you are a member, thank you so much. And if you are not, please, please consider making an annual support through membership. It means so much to us. Uh, finally, thank you to everyone who made a donation when they joined for this program today. Everything's on pause, as you know, so your support is, is even more valuable than ever. So thank you so, so much. Um, finally, we have an upcoming event I wanted to discuss very briefly. This is scheduled for this Saturday. However, uh, it looks like a tropical storm may be coming through, so we'll let you know if anything changes but it's scheduled for this Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. and that's gonna be held on our Kassam property, 434 Park Avenue. It's an outdoor, completely outdoor event, antique sale. Masks, masks are going to be required and we're going to be keeping social distancing and so it should be a nice event. This is a reschedule of our Antiques in April event that was not able to be held in April. Um, any questions, you can write to me in the chat box and I will send these out in emails too. And I, again, I'll let you know if anything changes for that date. All right, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Toby Kassam, uh, he is a trustee of the Huntington Historical Society and he is involved in many other Huntington-based history organizations. He's also involved with the um, Van Wyck Leffert's Tide Mill, which we're going to be talking about today. He was a math teacher by trade. Let's see where I'm admitting somebody here. Um, but he is hugely, enormously knowledgeable about the history of Huntington. And he is going to, lost my place. So he's going to tell us all about the, the Tide Mills or the mills today. Um, also, we have Robert Hughes, who has served as our town historian for the last 18 years. 
He is an employee of the town of Huntington and works closely with us at the Historical Society and all of our local history institutions to preserve and interpret the history of our town. All right, so on to our speakers. Thanks again for joining us and I hope you enjoy. Robert, are you starting? Uh, I think I am. Toby, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, welcome everybody and thanks again for joining us. Uh, today we're uh, going to try to combine two of our events, annual or regular events into virtual events. One is the Lunch and Learn, obviously. And the second one is the, the tours to the Leffert's Tide Mill that we would normally be running this year, except for the fact that obviously you can't keep social distance when you squeeze 18 people into a, a launch and that's the way we would have to get out there. Uh, this is a talk that uh, we first put together uh, for the Tide Mill Institute of America uh, group uh, that had a uh, conference in uh, Queens that talked about the Tide Mills in the Northeast area of which one of the, the mills, the Leopard's Tide Mill that still exists and that we're looking at today, uh, we're looking at right now, uh, uh, was the was the main reason that we were asked to speak at that event, but uh, the this talk really is going to be about all the mills of Huntington and uh, throughout its history. Uh, last month's lunch and learn, we talked about the early settlers and where they settled and the settlement around the village green. Uh, this talks about you know how they produced what they needed to produce early on. Uh, they certainly needed. Their, their wheat grind and their corn milled and uh, they needed logs to be sawn and sawn and uh, to build things. Uh, and so what we've been able to de determine is that there were 14 tide mills uh, or 14 mills that were built in Huntington uh, from the late 17th century to the middle of the 19th century. Um, and we'll come back to this one, but let's go to the next slide, Robert. Uh, this is what we were looking at in that aerial view on where the uh, Ben White Leffert's Tide Mill is. Uh, you'll see the arrows and you'll see some of the things that we're pointing out. It's in Lloyd Harbor. Uh, it's really one of the, the gems uh, that, secret gems really, or hidden gems that uh, are in the historic building inventory of Huntington. Not many people are aware of it, uh, but we'll come back and talk more about that later. Let's look at the next slide. This is uh, the timeline where we started in 1657, where Huntington's first grist mill uh, was uh, constructed on what is Mill Lane uh, in uh, Huntington. Uh, there's no mill there now. The, the Water Authority does have a, a brick building there. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with the intersection as it crosses over New York Avenue. Uh, that was the location of the first uh, grist mill. It was uh, a river driven freshwater uh, mill. That's uh, one of the things of the 14 grist mills, uh, 10 of them were powered by fresh water, one was by wind, and three of them were tide mills, and, and we'll talk about the distinction between those. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, the stream had to have a mill pond and had to collect mill, uh, water so that it had enough to power a mill um, caused a problem in Huntington in the early age where with uh, the mill attracting uh, mosquitoes and things like that. So they, this first mill was taken down in uh, 1672 and uh, the Centiport's first mill, the grist mill, was built in 1674. Now that is also a freshwater uh, mill. It, it was fed by the the pond that's on the north side of 25A, which is fed by the twin ponds on the south side of 25A, as you go into, uh, uh, as you go east on 25A. Uh, that mill, of course, no longer still is, is not there anymore, but the millstone uh, still exists from that mill. Uh, then in 1681, there was the first grist mill in Lloyd Harbor, and is really uh, at that same location that we saw earlier, um, but it was on uh, the John Samus uh, homestead lot, which was at the foot of, uh, which was then an, an open cove. There was no uh, mill dam at the time. They still had to create a pond to collect the water to drive the grist mill. And uh, it's uh, that, some of that is still evident today. 
in uh, 82, 1682, Cold Spring Harbor had its first grist mill, and those were on the, the three ponds that go along, uh, uh, what is it, Route 107, Robert? Yeah. Um, that uh, along in Cold Spring Harbor there by the church. And then in uh, 1732, uh, this probably is a, was considered a second grist mill, and we're not sure that this one actually was used as a grist mill. The original building from Huntington's first grist mill was moved uh, up to Creek Road uh, and became a residence, uh, and then was owned by the Crippen family, which is a, a building that's much in discussion today in Huntington. And then the first of the tide mills uh, was constructed in Huntington at the a foot of uh, Huntington. And we're going to look at each one of these as we go along. Centerport's second grist mill, which was also a tide mill, was in 1774. Uh, the Conklin paper mill, a freshwater mill, was 1782. Uh, the grist mill in Cold Spring Harbor that was on the harbor, but it was fresh driven, freshwater driven. Uh, the Van White Leffert's Tide Mill, which we saw, is, an, is the third of the Tide Mills. And then the, uh, the Woolen Mill on Cold Spring Harbor on those lakes. And then the Samus Sawmill, which was the, uh, the wind-driven mill. And finally, Northport's Mill was built in 1830. So those are the 14 structures that we're going to talk about. Uh, and I think, Robert, we're going to start at the east end. Uh, one of the things that uh, is uh, is clear, this I guess I'm, these are a map of where all the locations of those mills that I just talked about were. Um, the blue represents the freshwater, uh, the red circle where the tide mills were, and the green star uh, was where the windmill existed. Uh, and we'll talk about each one of them as we go along. But in each one of these locations, you'll see we have two roads that are called Mill Dam Roads that still exist. Uh, we have a sawmill road uh, that now dead ends, but it used to run to the sawmill on the Cold Spring Harbor from Woodbury Road. Uh, we have Mill Lane in uh, Lloyd Harbor, which is the uh, road that goes down past the police booth that runs to the first, the John Samus Mill, and then to the Leffert's Tide Mill. Uh, and there are a number of other, uh, well, there are a number of grist mills that are on exhibit throughout the town, uh, and we'll talk about some of them as we go along. But I guess Robert's now going to start with the Northport Mills on the east end of Huntington. Yes, as Toby said, we're going to work from east to west, uh, so not in chronological order. This mill um, is the Chichester Mill, uh, pretty much where Britannia Yacht Club is on the curve of the road of 25A. Um, which you can see on the map in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it was a freshwater-fed mill, and the water came from the other side of 25A and came across in that pipe um, up here, across the street uh, into the mill. It had to be high enough to get a wagon load of hay uh, underneath it. Uh, and that was always, for many years, considered a, a landmark. You knew if you were getting close to Northport coming from the west, once you passed the mill. And you were actually in, if you look at the bottom right of this old postcard, it says you were in South Northport, which is uh, an interesting way to describe a place. And I don't <laughs> think anyone uses that term anymore to describe that uh, area of town. Then in Centerport, uh, the second mill in the town of Huntington to replace the one that they closed down in 1672 was built in Centerport in 1674. And this is pretty much where the Chalet Motor Inn uh, is today. And it was fed uh, water coming from the, um, from the pond there flowing into the harbor. And you can see the overflow from Centerport Lake in that postcard on the right side um, and then the other picture below it. Uh, and you see David DeMilt was running that grist mill in 1885. At the same time, Andrus Titus was busy running the other mill. Um, and here you see the map. This is the first mill from 1674's down by the pond. And the second mill in Centerport was a tide mill. And that is up where that, what is now Mill Dam Road, where the eagles are. Uh, the eagles actually nest down by the first mill. And people see them from the second mill, just coincidentally. So this is a view of the, of, uh, the second mill, the Tide Mill in Centerport, painted by Edward Lang. 
This is the millstone from the first mill. It was found behind uh, the chalet back in the 1970s, I guess. And uh, whoever found it called the Greenland Center for Historical Association and said, do you want this? And Toby was the one who was tasked to go over there and get it, put it in his van and save it. Uh, and then it was uh, not too long ago, um, a new park was created at the foot of Mill Dam Road in Centerport. And this was put up in the town calls it Grist Mill Park. Uh, but I understand little kids call it Cheerio Park, which I think is a, a better name. I like that better because it looks like a giant Cheerio. <laughs> Cheerio Park. This is an interesting picture of the dam. Uh, actually, it's not much of a picture of the dam because you can't really see the dam. The dam is underwater. This is the dam that it's closing off the, the head of uh, Centerport Harbor to impound the water at high tide. And then when the tide falls on the harbor side, you keep it at a higher level inside the pond until you're ready to release it and it will flow through and turn your wheel and make the, the mill go. And we'll talk more about the mechanics of mills uh, at the end of the talk uh, when we talked about the Van Leopard's mill. So you'll notice at high tide, the dam was topped by water. So they had to put these planks across so you could uh, get from one side of the harbor to the other. And here's a view looking west, the tide is not as high. So now you can start to see some of the dam there. And the, what the, at, when the tide was coming in, it would open these gates and fill the mill pond. And then as the tide started to fall, the gates would close and keep the water inside until you were ready to open the sluiceway at the other side by the mill. Now getting over to Huntington uh, Harbor. Here is, um, well, it shows the Crippen House. And there is some dispute about this, some question among historians. The first mill was further down on Mill Lane, as Toby mentioned, in uh, 1657. And they closed it in 1672. They talk of a second mill in Huntington being opened in 1732. And there's some disagreement about whether the second mill was what is now known as the Crippen House here on this map, um, or if it was a separate building, or if there even was a mill ever on Creek Road. That's a dispute that will take a lot more research for us to really finally come to a conclusion on, but we just point out that that is something that's in question. But in 1752, Zofar Platt built another a tide mill in Huntington, uh, actually the first tide mill in the town of Huntington, on what is now Mill Dam Road. So this was the harbor extended all the way down and they dammed it. Uh, and this water has now been filled in and is baseball fields for the most part. There's still mill pond over here. Um, this mill survived until 1930s, but we have several uh, photographs and uh, paintings of it. it at, uh, eventually was owned by W.W. W. Woods. And you can see he owns the house over here, um, which still stands. And if you went straight across Mill Dam Road and up, you would get to his house, which was a very imposing house overlooking his um, wooden coal yard and his mill. So here is the mill. And what's interesting here is this is Mill Dam Road. The, a, a tide mill is an undershot wheel, which means the water goes under the wheel to turn it counterclockwise. And if you were walking down Mill Dam Road, you would get splashed by the water coming over the wheel. So they put this little splash guard up, which is an interesting little tidbit that I, Toby just told me about that yesterday. Now here's a view of the mill that was painted uh, around 1900. And here is Wilton Woods house up on the top of the hill. And here's an even more imposing view of the house. Um, and it is a spectacular house that still stands on uh, Preston Drive in Huntington. To operate a mill, you just need to turn something to get some gears flowing. And mostly we're familiar with them being done by water power, whether it's a stream or the tides. Huntington also had a windmill built in 1826 um, by Daniel Samus up on the hill behind where is the uh, Huntington Post Office is today. Uh, it, those 
uh, wings or wings the word I want? What's the word I want? It's a wind direction. Yeah, the, no, words, not, not, the, not the weather vane. Oh, oh the, the sails. Fans? The sails that would, so, would turn yeah. the, uh, the wheel. Those are about maybe six feet high, and there are stories about kids always wanting to go up there for a little merry-go-round ride. So they would climb up the scaffolding and take a ride around. I'm not sure that was very safe, uh, but that's what they did. And as you can see with all the locks out front, this was a sawmill. Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the apparatus on the top blew over in a, a storm in 1867, and Daniel Samus converted the building to a barn, moved it down to lower ground closer to Main Street. But the interesting fact is you can see in the view from 1841 above, if you came into Huntington from the direction of Cold Spring Harbor, this is 25A by around Wolsey Street, uh, one of the first things you would see is this unique mill and Old First Church off in the distance. The weather vane that stood on the top of the mill, which you see up here, was damaged when the mill blew over in 1867 and part of the wing broke off but somebody saved it and eventually gave it to the Huntington Historical Society, which is now used that as the logo for uh, the Historical Society. So wonderful piece of folk art. Now getting to Cold Spring Harbor, one of the early mills here um, was built by Richard Conklin and was a paper mill, 1782. This is just to orient ourselves, this is Main Street, Cold Spring Harbor, 25A. Here is Shore Road where the old library, uh, the Brick Library building is located. So in, actually in the pond is where Richard Conklin built the paper mill. Uh, the, the contours of this area have been completely changed. The, what they call Fireman's Park uh, behind the old library is all landfill. Um, and another mill was built in 1791 by the Jones and Hewlett family was down here uh, closer to uh, the turn over to uh, the fish hatchery. But this is the paper mill. We had a, a drone go up in uh, <laughs> 1782 and take a picture of this paper mill. Now this is actually the diorama from the Cold Spring Harbor Whaling Museum, uh, which is one of the best ways to get visual representations of um, early uh, 19th century Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, the gentleman who worked on this, Peter Bongo, did an extensive amount of research. So we're fairly confident that he was very accurate in uh, his depictions of Cold Spring Harbor in the 1850s. So this would have been the paper mill and here's Shore Road coming across and, and up the side of the harbor. The grist mill that I pointed out before from 1791 um, was here on the harbor, but it was not a tide mill. It did not re use the tides to power the wheel. It instead had the water from St. John's Lake, was fed through a canal, which you see here, all the way across along 25A and into the mill. Um, as you can see here, 25A used to run across the mill dam right in front of St. John's Church. This is the fish hatchery now. 25A today follows more of this line. Here's the mill. Um, 1791 mill on the side of the harbor and here you can see the canal coming through into a trough and uh, turning the uh, wheel which is inside the mill building. Uh, the mill burnt, burnt down in uh, 1921. Uh, some other mills, this is again the, the grist mill up here. Uh, there was a woolen mill that the Jones family operated, um, really got their start around the War of 1812 when there were no imports from England, um, but then after the war was over and more imports came in, they didn't do so well. Uh, back here is the site of the early sawmill from the 17th century. So this is the beginning of Sawmill Road, it used to come off Harbor Road to connect the sawmill to Huntington Village. Um, later on, this uh, served as a woolen mill at different times, and uh, they also had an organ factory uh, in that location. Uh, this is the, the Willen Mill on 25A that I pointed out that's now on the grounds of the Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Again, fresh water from a pond up on 25A near Moores Hill Road came down across 25A and uh, fed the mill there. And this is the, the upper dam or the second dam uh, in Cold Spring Harbor uh, 
where the original sawmill would have been. I think Toby, you're taking over from now. Okay, um, this is uh, the mill that uh, we talked about earlier. We saw the aerial view of the mill pond uh, that still exists. Uh, this building still exists on its original dam. It was built, we believe, in 1797, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But in 17 in 1975, uh, it was visited by uh, uh, T. Alan Comp of the National Park Service, and he described it the following way, and this is why it's such an important uh, structure for us here in Huntington and for all those that uh, are interested in mills of any sort. In the seven years I spent as a senior historian of the Historic American Engineering Record, Van Wick Leffert's Tide Mill or Mill still stands out as a remarkable survivor, perhaps the only one of its kind to still remain in, with so many of its original features. And that's the unique part about this. It's a stationary mill now. It hasn't run since probably, oh, they may have run it in the, in the late uh, 19th century, but uh, it certainly doesn't look like it, it's run since then. But all of the original gears are still there. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll talk about exactly who built it uh, and who ended up uh, running it. Uh, the Van Wyck, uh, Van Wyck, excuse me, uh, family uh, bought a farm from the Rogers family in 1787. Uh, and he was the son, uh, you'll see him at number 51, is Captain Abraham Van Wyck. Uh, he came over from Oyster Bay. Let's go back, yeah. He had a brother, Samuel Van Wyck. Uh, Samuel had a, had a son, also Abraham Van Wyck, who would have been the nephew of the original, and he ended up buying, uh, he ended up marrying the, the, old, the youngest daughter of uh, the first Abraham. They call him Abraham Sr., but these aren't senior and junior, but Abraham the older, let's call him. Uh, he married the, uh, Zahara was the uh, oldest, youngest daughter, and so two first cousins married and they bought the farm from their father and father-in-law, uncle, if you'd like, uh, in 1793. Now, Sarah, the older daughter, had married Cole's Warpman. And Warpman comes out uh, and buys uh, some land from John Samus uh, on the opposite side of the cove. When we look at a map, you'll see on the north side, of uh, the cove uh, is where Wardman's bought the land from John Samus on the south side of the cove is basically where the Van White farm was. Uh, and in 1793, just before he sells to his father-in-law, he gets permission to build a mill uh, and to replace the earlier John Samus mill at the, at the head of the harbor. He gets permission to build a dam across, which would be a public waterway. Uh, so he could create this tide mill that still stands today. Now the, the uh, Van White family continues to own the farm well into the 20th century, uh, but the ownership of the mill uh, is an in interesting as it follows uh, along there. Sarah Wartman dies in 1795 and Cole goes back, Cole's Wartman goes back to uh, Oyster Bay, and he really is out of the picture after he sells that. But he sells his uh, half of the, uh, his portion of it to the father and nephew, uh, both Abrahams. Uh, and eventually the senior Abraham, the older Abraham sells it to the younger Abraham. Uh, we don't feel Warman ever built the mill, uh, but he sells his property uh, or rights to it. Uh, and uh, we believe the mill was built between 1793 and 1798. In 1797, the elder Van White uh, sold his share to his daughter and son-in-law and nephew uh, for 200, 250 pounds, and so they became the sole owners of the mill. So if we look at the next slide. This is the homestead that uh, Abraham, the elder Abraham bought in uh, 1787. He bought it from the Rogers family. It, we believe it was built in about 1735. Uh, it was an early, the Rogers family was an early settling family out there uh, along with the Samus family. Uh, 
and unfortunately, um, this house, which was expanded over the years, but still maintained its historical integrity, uh, was most recently torn down. Uh, but inside that were a number of uh, uh, woodworking. And uh, it was interesting to see, uh, I had a chance to get into it before it was torn down. Uh, and I understand that the woodwork was sold to a, a salvage place up in Connecticut. And one of the things they took was the lower corner cupboard. And it was fascinating for me to walk in and see this corner cupboard because the corner cupboard pictured above uh, is very similar to it in design and actually comes from a house that we talked about last month. Uh, um, it was the Wood Homestead, the Silas Wood Homestead that is just south of the Kassam House on Park Avenue. Uh, that building was torn down in 1882, but the corner cupboard from the original, uh, if you'll remember the original uh, uh, Cape Cod uh, um, style house was taken out and reinstalled in the existing Victorian building. So it's still there. And uh, this is an earlier picture of it, but it still is saved. So we're both houses, both the original uh, uh, Wood House and the original uh, Van White House are gone. Both of these corner cabinets survived, one here in Huntington at its same location, and the other one, uh, we're not sure where it ended up. Now, the only difference between these two corner cupboards would be that the top doors have been switched to, to glazing. That probably is not an original feature that was built back in the early 18th century or late, 19, uh, late 17th century, but uh, in a more modern time, they would have re- flopped, switched out those doors so they could show the interior. But you can't, it's hard to see, but the fanning up inside in the, uh, on the top shelf is in both. The doors are almost identical and the uh, columns on each side are, are very, very similar. So it helps us age. We know how old the wood house would have been, though we don't know exactly when this would have been built in it. Uh, and we think the Van Wyck house is about 1735. It could be a little earlier because the Rogers family owned that property for a long time. Okay, next slide. Now, Abraham, this is the uh, senior Abraham, a photograph of it. Uh, he bought the head, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the younger. Uh, this is the younger Abraham. Uh, he bought it from his uncle in 1793 uh, and from his brother-in-law, Coles Wartman. Uh, we don't think the, the mill was actually built till 1795, but before he let it go, he stamped his, uh, uh, branded his name on the furniture. This is the horse, and uh, this is Bob, who I understand is with us today. Bob Rubner uh, uh, is listening, and I'm sure he has an opinion on how I'm talking about it, but uh, uh, this is, he's our guide on our tour, and uh, He's here pointing out uh, uh, the hopper and the horse that the hopper sits into, uh, and uh, and you see the stamp name. There are actually two of these, and they both have his uh, name stamped in it, though we don't think he was ever the miller. Now, another interesting connection with uh, the Park Avenue properties is that the, the barn that is on the Kassam property uh, that you saw briefly there off to the side in our advertisement for the antiques fair, actually came from this Rogers or Van Wyck house uh, down on which would be Van Wyck Lane today. Uh, it was moved in, in the 1970s uh, by the, the current owners, wanted to sell off some land so newer houses could be built there uh, and wanted to get rid of this structure. And somehow the Historical Society had their act together and was able to uh, hire a firm, come take it down and reinstall it on the Kassam property and we're very fortunate to have it today uh, in, in that property because we use it constantly. Next slide. Okay, in the old burying ground, this is a right outside uh, window that you can see in the uh, uh, Soldiers and Sailors Memorial is the Van Wyck uh, uh, Cemetery uh, plot. And here is Abraham the Younger and Zahara Ben White, both her maiden name and her married name, uh, uh, are buried. Next. 
Now, interesting enough, when I was going through the Van Wyck uh, genealogy, uh, this mill showed up and, and there was no explanation on why it is. The Gerritsen Tide Mill is in Gravesend in, in Brooklyn. Uh, when I looked it up on the internet, I did, it, was, it was the location really of the first Tide Mill, or it was believed to be the first Tide Mill put in Brooklyn by the Dutch uh, and of course rebuilt over the years. It no longer stands, it is now uh, a parkland, I understand. Uh, but I couldn't quite figure out why it uh, was in the, the Van Wyck genealogy until I looked at the genealogy a little bit closer. And I discovered that Samuel and, and the elder Abraham had a sister, Sarah, uh, who, whoops, we're going back, okay. Who happened to marry a Simon Corlew, which is again an old Brooklyn name, uh, and had a daughter, Mary, who married John S. Gerritsen, who was the miller at the time of that Gerritsen Tide Mill. And so they would have been first cousins to both, uh, well, Abraham and his wife, Sahara, uh, and the Coles Warpman, or his wife, uh, Sarah, but uh, more importantly, to the two owners of the mill at the time uh, in 1797. Now, the other thing that happened in, 17, in the 1790s was that uh, Oliver Evans uh, had developed a a particular uh, design of a mill that would be a, an automated mill that would essentially, essentially run itself. Uh, and we think uh, now, by, since the Van Wyck's had no other uh, uh, access to any tide mill expertise, that we think that John Gerritsen possibly or probably helped construct that mill out in Lloyd Harbor. But we'll uh, talk about that a little bit further. Uh, 1797, because in 1797, Abraham the Younger owned the complete mill, but in 1798, he sold half of the interest in that mill to the to two brothers, Samuel Lefferts and Henry Lefferts, and therefore it was run. Now, they did have connections to Tide Mill, uh, runnings of Tide Mill, and came from a Tide Mill history, uh, or Miller's history, and so they were Millers, in the in we follow through the ownership of that. Um, he sold 50% of it uh, to the Lefferts brothers in 1798. Another 25% of that was sold in 1802 to Dr. Daniel Whitehead Kassam, who was certainly not a farmer. He certainly had nothing to do with mills, but he was an investor. And so he bought it as, a, a, as an investment. He later bought another 25% of the mill uh, and so at some point he owned 50% of the Leopard's Tide Mill. So it's interesting that is the Van White barn ends up in the Kassam property who uh, was half owner of the mill uh, at some point. Now Samuel and uh, Henry ran the mill together. Uh, Henry had a, a son, Jarvis Leopard's. Now Jarvis Leopard's was basically uh, a house builder. Uh, he's uh, credited with building the DAR, uh, which is today the DAR house on Nassau Road, but it was originally uh, a church, uh, the Universalist Church, uh, before they moved down to uh, uh, New York Avenue, and then it became the manse to the Universalist Church. Today it is owned by the DAR and is their headquarters. Uh, and uh, the ownership of that mill ends up going to the sons of Henry uh, as well, who was a brother of Jarvis, but ended up either being inherited and by 1850, Jarvis Lefferts became the sole owner of the mill, or the 100% owner of the mill. Okay, here's some of the more, and here's some of the price and the devaluation of uh, the cost of the mill, but by 1850, Jarvis, Leffert owns 100% of the mill. He dies in 1882. Uh, the question, the mills were run either as mercantile mills or custom mills. Now a mercantile mill would buy the produce from the farmer and so he would own the result, the, the flour and the grain that came out of the mill. Where uh, a custom mill would take 10% of what a farmer brings him and leave the rest of it uh, for the farmer. Uh, we think it started out as a mercantile mill with uh, investors like Kassam and, and some of the other Samuses uh, that owned partial 
parts of the mill. Uh, but in the end, we think it was probably run as a custom mill uh, by Jarvis Lovers. Um, now, after he dies in 1882, if we go back slide for a minute. Uh, he sells the, the mill uh, in, in the, or Willard Samus, who takes ownership of it, but ends it up in Jenkins Van Shake uh, ownership, who owned the neighboring summer estate uh, called Kalmia Park. Uh, if some of you were on an earlier house tour, we had uh, an early Samus farmhouse uh, that was in, that was the gatehouse for Camellia Park. It, that was originally built by uh, Chamberlain, but uh, in the, eight, in the uh, 1840s. Uh, but by 1860, 1886, it was owned by Van Shake, and they continued to own it through descendants, both the mill, the miller's house and the mill dam and a number of other houses that surrounded the mill uh, until uh, the, the Clairevilles uh, donated it to the, uh, uh, what, donated it to where? Donated it to the, the Nature, Nature Conservancy. Conservancy. Yeah, I don't have that down. Oh yes, uh, in 69, donated it to the Nature Conservancy, who with help from, uh, the preservation uh, of Long Island uh, used to be called Splia, uh, and help from the Huntington Historical Society restored it in 1994. But in 2018, the Nature Conservancy really didn't wasn't interested in conserving a building, so they transferred the ownership to the Van Wyck's Tide Mill Sanctuary Group, which owns it today, which is a nonprofit organization. Uh, Robert and I both serve on the mill on the board of that uh, group and uh, we're helping it to restore the structure and keep the dam intact. Next, okay. Now this is, uh, we fell out of the genealogy of the Lefferts uh, uh, mill and shows how uh, Harmon and Mary Leffert had two brothers, Samuel and Henry, uh, and they were the ones that uh, bought half of the mill from the Ben White family in 1798. And the next slide uh, shows the how the Lefferts were involved really in the milling business in Brooklyn and in uh, Jamaica. Uh, this is a deed not of a of a mill uh, in Gowanus, which was called the Hook, uh, that was owned by uh, an Isaac uh, Lefferts there, who was the son of uh, well, who was a first cousin to Harmon Lefferts, and it was Harmon Lefferts' children. Henry and Samuel, who bought the Van Wyck Leopard's Mill in 17. Now, this is uh, Jarvis Leopard's uh, uh, Cemetery. This is not in the old burying ground, but up in the, the new burying ground or the rural cemetery uh, on New York Avenue. And its uh, uh, headstone is made out of zinc. It's an obelisk that's made out of zinc. And it's interesting, you'll notice on one side you see uh, a corn, ear of corn, as you see there on the on the left side and on the opposite side, which you can't see, was a shaft of wheat, uh, indicating that he was quite proud of being the miller uh, in town. And that's the way he wanted to be identified. Okay, now I think Robert's gonna talk about uh, how uh, the mill is the future or what the earlier, later history of the mill has been. More recent history. But More as recent. Toby mentioned, uh, the, the mill dam, uh, Mill Pond and the mill building itself were owned by the Van Shake family and their descendants until uh, 1969 when the Declare Bills gave it to the Nature Conservancy uh, along with an, an endowment. And the Nature Conservancy obviously is more interested in preserving the uh, nature preserve, uh, not historic buildings, but they did undertake a couple of restoration efforts. There was an effort in 1980s where they replaced some of the beams and the bigger effort in 1994, uh, which they got uh, state funding for. Um, and uh, they, somebody put up this sign, which Toby has some quibbles with the dates. Uh, didn't think the 1882 was quite right. Probably ceased operation before 1870. As you saw uh, in one of the earlier slides, uh, Mr. Lefferts was no longer listed as a miller in the 1870 census. But it is important because it's, it has its original wooden gears and that's what makes this uh, mill unique. Going back to the property, this is a little bit of an overview. Uh, 
So this is that farmhouse we mentioned uh, that the Van Wykes owned, uh, the Coles Wartman house up here. Coles Wartman uh, originally had the permission to dam the, the cove here. Here's the dam, here's the mill, the mill pond. And we believe there was an earlier mill here uh, that was uh, stream fed uh, and it was operated by John Samus and his house still stands at the end of Mill Lane. This is South Down Road as it curves around. This is the Coles Wartman house. Um, it's been greatly expanded since it was built in the late 18th century. The original part of the house is probably this three bay section in the middle. Uh, we, Toby and I, toured the house top to bottom and uh, the foundation, and you can see where there would have been uh, an original Long Island half house with a three bay wing and then a service wing off to one side. And uh, just as we had with the cupboards, we saw another echo of uh, other, another building in the banisters. Uh, on the right is the Kassam house, that's the banister. And the Kassam house was built in 1795 and a very similar banister is in the Wartman house, uh, even though, and the house was built around the same time. So um, there's some consistency and probably, you know, there's only a few builders around in town at that time. The, the Lefferts lived in this house, which still stands um, next to the mill. Here is the mill and here is the house. I got that right? The arrow seems to be going to the wrong place, but it should be over here. Yes, uh, you're right. Yeah, and the old Samus farmhouse. And this is Van Shake, who owned the big estate here, but purchased this property uh, later on. This is an interesting 1881 survey before Jarvis Stufford's died. This is the road from Huntington to Paulding's. And that's uh, Admiral Paulding, who lived where um, Panfield is today, the, uh, the Millbank Estate. So that's, Mill, uh, that's South Down Road. And Mill Lane would be over this way to the right. And this is now a private driveway, but this is how you would have gotten to the mill back in the 19th century. And here's the mill over here, and here's the harbor. And here's a view taken from up the hill further uh, to the west. And you can see the, the mill here across the pond. And off in the distance here is the, the Wartman house. Uh, it's hard to make out. And there's another building with a tower uh, there. Uh, here's a, a painting by RNW, who also painted a very similar looking uh, picture of the Huntington Mill. We cannot quite figure out what this building is over here. But that tower is similar to the tower we saw in the uh, photograph, but it seems to be in the wrong location. So that might be a little artistic license. Uh, here's another view looking across the pond uh, at the mill. And where this, uh, all these little trees are is an old stream. And that is probably the stream that fed the original mill built by John Samus. Uh, off in the distance here, you can see across the harbor, that's Ferguson's Castle which a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, it's another similar view from the 20th century postcard. And here's a, a photograph of the mill around 1900. You can see the wheel. Uh, unfortunately, the wheel is no longer there, um, but it, it uh, survived till about the turn of the 20th century and probably fell apart. It's the only part of the building that does not still exist. At one point, a garage door or carriage house door was added here uh, because they used to park cars inside the mill. And the Van Schaik family put a swimming platform into the harbor, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and here's a dock to bring your boat up at high tide. Here's the mill in more recent years. It used to be red. The red paint is all pretty much faded away. Uh, there's also some new siding on it after the uh, 1994 project. Now this talk a little bit about how uh, a tide mill works here. Here we have the harbor, Huntington Bay, or the harbor, and the dam. And there's an opening, uh, a sluiceway here. And when the tide is coming in, it would push this gate up and allow the water in. But once the pond was full, the tide would close and the water pressure would keep it closed 
and then the water in the harbor would fall uh, as we approach low tide. And then we have a disparity between the height of the pond and the height of the harbor. And this gives you some sense of the amount of volume of water that rushes through and how strong the current is. Um, you really appreciate it when you go out on the tour uh, and walk down and see this for yourself. Uh, it really does rush through there at a great velocity. And here you can see it again. This is what you would see if you went out on the tour and hopefully by next year we'll be able to have tours again. Um, this is the waters flowing out from the mill pond. The sluiceway that fed the, that turned the wheel has, is now closed. So now this uh, canal way goes both ways. It, it handles both the incoming tide and the outgoing tide, which is not how it would have been done historically. And this is one of the surviving uh, tide gates. Uh, it's, it's in rough shape, but uh, it gives you an idea how it would pivot at the top to open and then close. Here is the sluice, whoops. Here's the sluice way that fed the water through to the wheel and would turn the wheel. There was not a lot of traffic on this dam, so there's no splash guard to protect people from the water uh, splashing off the wheel. And we'll get a little bit into this. We're gonna actually show you pictures of all of these gears later on. The only thing that's missing, of course, is the wheel. And here you can see looking through from the, the uh, mill pond through the building and in blue is where the wheel would have been. And this gives you some idea of, you know, the, the water flowing through where the, uh, the wheel is, the sluice way. It breached, the water really wants to go where the water wants to go and it was flowing here for 200 years and it wanted to flow there again. Um, and so it did but it's since been closed up again because it's damaging the foundation of the mill and uh, the dam itself. This is more what it looks like filled in um, so it's solid ground and the wheel would have been right up here. And that's just another view. And here's an old millstone. We don't really know if this comes from the mill because inside the mill are two pairs of millstones intact this may be something that they, they picked up somewhere else along the way, or maybe a, wheel, a stone that uh, got too worn and they had to replace it with a newer stone. So Toby, you're gonna pick up here with the gears? Okay, yeah, uh, a number of things. Uh, one is that stone, I just thought that stone could have come from the smaller John Samus original yeah. thing. They may have found that and, and brought that there because it seems to be much smaller than the stones that are in the mill today. Um, this is really the guts of and what makes this such an important uh, uh, structure uh, historically. Um, what we're looking at is actually some missing uh, pieces that need to be replaced and the, the, the Tide Mill Sanctuary Group hopes to rebuild the inside of this to, to secure it a bit better. But this would have been a pinion that would have been uh, driven uh, driven the gears in the upper part that the, from the power that came from the water wheel. Let's see what else we got. It's going to be, that's, there's something missing there. There should be something on it. Um, yeah, I guess the, the, it's, it's hard to talk about this without seeing other slides, but if, the, if you can imagine the big uh, wheel turning outside the building, driven, uh, working counterclockwise, it would have driven a shaft to the inside of the building. Attached to that wheel would have been uh, something they uh, called a, a pit wheel, I think. Uh, let me just get my, my notes here to make sure that I've got the right uh, terminology to it. Um, yeah, the pit wheel, which would have been uh, gears that would have engaged what they call the wallower. What we're looking at is a horizontal uh, gear that gets hooked into something very similar on top is is hooked on to the uh to the big uh water wheel and that goes into the wallower which is the wheel the vertical uh spokes there uh and turns that which in turns attaches um this the gears up above on top and that hooks into what they call two other sets of gears and maybe the next slide will show those 
Yeah, here are, the, here are the two, what they call pinions, and in behind that, below it, you can see the, the wallower. So that gets turned by the, by the pit wheel that's attached to the water wheel. That turns that, uh, um, what do they call that, the great spur wheel on top, and this turns these two other smaller pinions, they call, and both of those are what drives the two stones, two sets of stones up on the second floor. So you can imagine the, uh, uh, this is looking underneath uh, one of those pinions uh, and you can see uh, how it, the, the vertical uh, iron piece that goes into that little piece of iron that's missing in that earlier slide. Uh, this goes up to the, this gets turned and, and turns the, the wheel, the upper wheel up on the second floor that does the actual grinding of the wheat and the corn. Uh, this is Bob showing this from the inside, and what we're looking at is one of those pinion wheels uh, looking through uh, that part of the mill to the outside again, and he's explaining that. And he's probably showing off this mass of beams that hold up that section of the mill because it's that section of the mill that has to hold up the two sets of stones. And when you see the stones when we get upstairs, you'll see the weight that they must, be, they must have. Uh, this is actually, uh, goes up to the third floor ho hoist on the third floor. The whole operation of this, and this is of the Oliver Evans design. And one of the things we're gonna encourage you to do at the end of this talk is to, uh, we've got a link to uh, a, a YouTube uh, seven minute video that shows a restored, mill down at Mount Vernon really uh, and George Washington's property because um, he, Oliver Evans, worked on this automated mill in the uh, 1780s and by 1790 he had applied for a patent and he got the very the third patent issued in the United States government uh, for this automated mill and George Washington ordered one of them to be put on his property um, and it, it fell apart, it was no longer in existence, but one of the things that they did is they restored it back to its original condition. It's a restoration, it's brand new, but it shows all of the activity. And one of the things that this does is that it starts with the farmer bringing his, his uh, produce and then them hoisting it up to the third floor, which is uh, all by mechanical mechanics and, and gear ratios that were from the power of that water wheel. And so here we are on the third floor where it, from the outside, they would have hoisted up the, uh, the grain and brought it over to uh, another, let's take a look at the next uh, slide and see what we get. This is, uh, this is the third floor uh, as it is today really more. Uh, and it was a working floor. There was lots of activity going up on this. And one of the things the Oliver Evans thing did, they they used gravity to, to go from down from floor to floor. And then he created this system of elevators, all powered by the water wheel that lifted the produce at its different states up again so that it could use gravity again to fall down. Basically, it starts on the ground, goes up to the third floor, goes down to the second, gets ground, goes down to the first floor, then gets elevated up again to the third floor, goes down to the second floor and so forth. So up on the third floor, this is uh, what is called, uh, uh, this is where it's, uh, the, the, it gets clean sort of, it's a, it's a shaker, it's a, that still exists up on the third floor and we're looking at that. And that shakes the grain down into a, a gatherer, a garner, I think they call it. Let's, let's see if we have any order to this. No, we're still up on the third floor. Once it gets to the third floor, it has to be um, smutted. Now, I'm not sure where in the process that this gets done. This is called a smutter, and some of the uh, negative stuff that ends up in the flour has to be uh, shaken out of it or, or detached from it. Uh, and you can see all of this operations. Now, what we don't have is all of the belts and so forth that tie this all together. Once we get a better understanding, we hope to recreate some of this, not to make it into a working mill again, because we would ruin the historic years, but at least to demonstrate exactly all the steps in the process.
this is again uh, Bob pointing out uh, something we don't unfortunately don't uh, the tour doesn't go up to the third floor anymore if we can uh, make it a little safer up there uh, we may be able to take tours up to the third floor but this is part of where the power comes off the, the water wheel and this is where uh, this is where we're on the second floor, I think, where the grain is dropping down into that uh, sifter and, and then it eventually goes into a garner. And now we're on the second floor. Uh, the garner is that uh, the thing that sits over the, the hopper. Uh, Robert, if you can get a, no, over the next one. Yeah, these are both of the wheels are set up. Uh, the horses and everything are set up over both wheels. You can see how the top wheel, which is uh, the bottom wheel is stationary. It's the top wheel that turns and it's been lifted off of its uh, uh, the lower wheel and it can flip over so they, they can re-sharpen the, the grooves. They have to constantly do that. Uh, and you can see all of the gears up above there. They're all running different uh, operations uh, all automated by the Oliver Evans design. And okay, here's the garner that you see. It would come down through that sifter into an elevator up to the garner. It would drop into the uh, hopper, which is held by the horse, and that's where the Van White name was. And then it would go down between the, the hole and the top stone to be ground. And uh, the top wheel would turn, would rotate, uh, bottom wheel stays stationary, uh, and the grain then would fall. All right, here's another view of it. Um, one of the things I didn't mention when we were down below is besides the two uh, pinions that run the, uh, the, the stones, there's a third pinion that operates all the auxiliary power. All of these, there are belts going all over the place. And what the impression you'll get when you see that video is actually it all in action. And it's very exciting in the, uh, about how it goes up and down between the floors. All right, here's Bob with the, uh, the, the shoe. And the shoe is an operation, is a, is a thing that feeds the grain from the hopper onto the stone. And it can be regulated on how much grain. You put too much grain between the stones, the stones will clog and, and shut down. Uh, but here is uh, something that the, the miller can, from this first floor, control the amount of grain that's going on into the stones. And here is where it would be located. It would be attached to a string and to a knob that would be controlled uh, down on the first floor and it would shake uh, and therefore control the amount of uh, grain that would go into between the, the two. Now, the, the grain would come out and be held in by uh, that housing that's around the two uh, uh, stones. Uh, so it would keep it within a controlled space and then it would go into a chute and the, and the grain would drop down to the first floor. All right, these are some of the, uh, uh, the spur wheels that would run the, the pinions. How you would, they would really be transmission of, from vertical power to horizontal power, uh, all based on the, the power developed by the, the water from the mill pond going over the big wheel. Here again is another picture, but one of the things that it shows is the, the grinding stone. Now that grinding stone would have been operated by the uh, water power as well. Uh, and we actually today did find a, a belt that strapped the, the, the wheel attached to the grinding wheel up to the, uh, the shaft that, that held another wheel that was uh, turned by the water power. I mean, it, to get it all figured out, uh, is something that we uh, may have to make a visit to the uh, uh, George Washington grist mill and, and see it in action to, to find out how all this is going to be worked. And I'm sure this has been modified over the years. Again, this is some of the, the gearing uh, that was looked. If anybody uh, has been to the Brandy uh, Wine River Valley, there's the DuPont uh, uh, museum there and it has uh, 
a factory uh, with a whole bunch of tools, all powered by water power, uh, or originally powered by water power anyway. And it shows all of these belts and uh, how the different machines that they drove and elevators that they moved uh, to carry the grain between the floors, carry the grain up. To, to move the grain horizontally, there were existence of what we call an Archimedes uh, uh, or a shaft or a wheel, I forget now what it was called. But these are, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, buckets from the elevators that would move the grain up. Uh, gravity, of course, would move the grain down. Okay, once you got, once the grain was down on the first floor, came in at, coming out of those chutes uh, from the second floor, it would get elevated up to the third floor again, we believe, where there had to be a drying process uh, attained. Then it would sift back down to the second floor, and these are some of the gears that are left over uh, that aren't in situ, uh, and that we hope to somehow find out where they would belong and how they would all fit in. That vertical shaft or uh, the horizontal shaft with the funny little things coming out is an example of an Archimedes uh, screw. screw. Archimedes screw, that's right, thanks. Um, now, oh, well, let's go back a slide for a minute. Now, the, the marks on the floor, we're on the second floor again. So from the third floor, it would drop down into what they call a bolter. And the bolter would be basically a, a tray uh, that would be put into the, the length of these, of those holes fit into that. And it would sift the flour and it would sift the different grades of flour, the very fine grade, coming out uh, uh, first. And then as you go down the line, they would leave the, the lesser grade flour. So your grade A flour would come in your first barrel. And this would all be done on down from the third floor to the second floor. And then from the second floor, it would drop down into barrels where it would be stored and waited to take off to market on the first floor. Let's go back a couple of slides, Robert. There's something else I'd like to point out. Uh, okay, well, this is the, this is a good slide, right. Uh, this is, was taken by that uh, Historic American Engineering Records when they visited it in 1975. You can see that big bar there on the uh, upper part of it, uh, kind of a lever, that, okay. That's what controls the, uh, the distance between the two uh, stones. Obviously, you had to get that right separation to get the exact kind of grinding. If it was too close, it would, uh, it would stop. If it was too far away, it wouldn't do efficient grinding. Uh, but that controlled the separation of the two stones up on the second floor. The grain would come down through those chutes there. And then it would go horizontally over toward the window. And there it would hook into an elevator that would take it up to, we believe, all the way up to the third floor, where it would drop into the bolter uh, that we looked at earlier. Um, okay, let's get back to where we, where we finished. Here's Bob pointing at that chute. That's part of the elevators. Okay. This was, uh, again, taken by in the 1975, we believe. It's looking south across the dam. And again, you're looking at the tidal gates uh, coming in here at the uh, lower part of that photograph. The sluice gate, of course, would be on the other side of the, of the mill where the big wheel is. Um, and uh, this is somewhat uh, in need of repair and we hope to get that done uh, or this fall. Uh, we're applying for a grant and hopefully we get the grant and we're gonna be able to repair the dam and possibly some add, replace some of the uh, timbers that are missing in the, in the mill itself. The, the house uh, there that you see is the miller's house. Uh, it, during the time that the Lefferts owned it, I'm sure it wasn't quite as big and as elegant as it is today. Uh, it's a beautiful house today, but the historic uh, integrity of that house has been saved. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, and luckily uh, that, owner of that house is also a member of the uh, Tide Mill Sanctuary Group. This is a picture of, again, uh, it doesn't quite uh, as well, you know, what is that, 45 years ago, uh, 
it was uh, the dam was in much better shape than it is today. It's obvious when you look at today's picture versus this picture, what needs to be done still. Uh, you can see the overhang at the at the ridge pole. The back overhang is where you would have the uh, pulley that would raise the gray the, the grain up to the third or up to the uh, third floor of the mill. Uh, and then you see the two levels of the mill uh, and the windows. This is another picture that's a little bit more recent, uh, but it was still taken uh, after it had stopped being read. I point out that at some point, probably back in the 1970s, they added cement around the foundation. Yeah. And that has all fallen away. And then in the 1980s, Yes, uh, the bulkhead right. was placed there instead, right. which is held up. Right, it's held up years. mostly. Uh, yeah, we're lucky. The foundation is in pretty good shape. And if you were on the tour, uh, this is the launch that would take you there. Uh, it passes by the Coles Wartman House. It used to pass by the uh, uh, the Van Wyck House when it was still stand uh, still standing on the south side of the cove. Uh, and the north side of the cove is the uh, Wartman House, and the house we're looking at actually is a Victorian house that was built by the Titus family and is today owned by the mayor of uh, Lloyd Harbor, uh, and uh, it's her house. And this is, again, we're looking at the mill from um, the north side, uh, looking south, and you see the mayor's house there on the left and the miller's house on the, on the right. And some of that is been eaten away. Uh, and you can see where it's beginning to be eaten away in that photograph. I'll finish with what T. Allen Kampf finished his uh, report with, and it is simply this, that today none survive with the historical integrity found in the Van Wyck Leopard's Tide Mill. The mill is a remnant of the past long vanished from Long Island, our only access to the actual craftsmanship and technology of pre-industrial America. Now, the, there were other tide mills all over Long Island. I mean, there were many, many, many tide mills. Uh, some still survive today. Some still survive on their uh, current uh, foundation, but none survive with the, uh, the gear work and the, uh, the 18th century mechanics that are still evident in, in the Leopard's Tide Mill. So it is really uh, a very important uh, mill uh, as far as tide mills are concerned or as far as oil mills are concerned but particularly uh, tide mills okay i think that's it um for us and so now we can answer any questions you may have tracy you there i'm here the screen's doing something weird. three-part question all right Thank you so much, Toby and Robert. So we'll get to the questions. I saw quite a few come through. Okay, so we'll start at the top. Um, someone asked about accessing last month's presentation. I can send that out to all attendees. We did record that. Uh, Janice said, so for Platt is my five great grandfather. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, interesting windmill. Uh, Bruce was trying to help you with the word. You were looking for veins. I think it's sales is what I wanted. Sales. Okay. sales. Thanks, Bruce. Um, Susan was asking what street was it on behind the post office? I'm not sure which slide that was referring to. That was That's the windmill. Out. There were no Yeah, streets. the windmill. Uh, that was up on uh, the, they flattened that, they dug out a lot of land to make it uh, that for the post office. Uh, what is today Clinton used to be Conklin and it used to go straight through. I think it is Conklin at the top still, isn't it? Or is it? Uh, no, I think it's still, it's Clinton on the other side too. It's Clinton the whole way? Um, okay. Uh, that used to go all the way through and in the 1950s and it was part of, uh, was it part of the uh, urban renewal projects? When they put in the post, new post office, office. Urban renewal yeah. project, yes. And they, they dug out a lot of it. It was really just up on the, the crest of the hill between Wall Street and, uh, um, West West Neck Avenue. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure if it was on a street or if it was just off in a field. Well, there were no streets, but it would have been more uh, sort of around Clinton and, and Central Avenue, somewhere up in that area. It's, it's, yeah, right. 
Okay. Um, Susan was also lamenting that the Van Wyck house was torn down. Oh boy. It's like a beautiful house. Okay. Um, there was a comment that Robert A. Van Wyck was the first mayor of New York City when it was consolidated. She went to the Robert A. Van Wyck Junior High School in Jamaica, Queens. Uh, right, and, and uh, I think they call the Van Wyck Highway, but it should be, is named after Mayor Van Wyck. Um, do you know who owns the old barn on Van Wyck Lane, just above the Van Wyck house that was torn down? Robert, you know who that person is, I think. Don't you? I think it's Lisa Casper. Yeah, it's it's almost a twin barn to the barn that was moved to the Kassam property, which was on the north side of Van Wyck Lane. Okay. All right, here we are, three part question. Number one, of the wheat and corn that was ground with these mills, how is it decided which mill sold to whom? sold to whom they the, the thinking was is that it, it's the possibility exists anyway with the two stones they would have grown they would have ground wheat in one of them and uh corn in the other and it's unclear whether they would have operated simultaneously or not um in a mercantile mill they would have the miller would have kept the produce and sold it uh in a custom mill he would have kept 10% of the produce and then given the rest back to the, to the farmer. And again, the feeling was is that it was a mercantile mill uh, in its beginning of the history. Uh, and then later uh, when uh, Jarvis owned it, uh, Jarvis Lefferts owned it by himself, it probably became more of an individual farmer bringing his produce and having it ground. And, and it probably only served the local farmers. Right. I don't think there right. was export. I mean, don't forget there was the big mill down in, in Huntington uh, at the head of the harbor, and there was a big mill over in Centerport that this was active. The next and, and the mill in Northport, so each harbor had its own mill at yeah. the same time, and Cold Spring Harbor as well. Yep. Okay, the next question sort of expounding on that was the product only sold to Huntington residents and if not, then do we know how far away flour from Huntington Mills was distributed for purchase? And the third question, did Huntington residents only get their flour from these mills or did they buy from other parts of Long Island or surrounding areas? Well, obviously the merchants in town could have bought them from anywhere. Uh, so they could have come from surrounding towns. Uh, the belief was is that there were the flour from this mill was shipped uh, at high tide. The the boats could come in. Uh, I think in one of those paintings you saw a boat uh, that would have transported barrels of uh, uh, or bags of wheat and flour uh, and meal, cornmeal, and uh, all over Long Island and in New York City possibly. We don't have any records. I mean, one of the things that's very exciting is that we just got uh, uh, an email from somebody contacted us who is a descendant of the Van Wyck family who has records from her great, 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 great ancestors involving the mill. Uh, and so it, it may, we may have to change our story a little bit when we see these records. Uh, as far as we are concerned that it was the Leopards that really ran the mill, but the Van Wyck's, um, they may have owned it for a period of time after that and therefore may have kept records on it. So we're interested in seeing that. Okay, we'll have to do a follow-up lunch and learn. <laughs> okay, uh, Sherry says, Thomas Benedict built a tide mill in Southhold in the 1630s and then moved to Huntington. His family then left for Connecticut, then New Haven. Could he have built a mill in Huntington? He could have. Uh, I mean, we don't know for sure that it was uh, the Gerritsen uh, family. Benedict is a name that I've run across in the early records, but I, I, when was he in Huntington? Now, that would be a key. We're talking 1630s, 40s. If that's what he was in Huntington, then he wouldn't have built, he probably wouldn't have built this mill unless he came, no, he wouldn't have, because this mill wasn't built until 1797 or 1790s anyway. No, he, uh, could he have built any mill 
We have no records in the early oh, town right. records of a mill yeah. before 1657 and then nothing until 1674. So it's, it doesn't appear in the town record. So it's unlikely he built a mill here. Okay. All right, that was the end of the questions. There was a question about Ferguson's castle. Did I miss that? Do you want to ask that, Toby, answer? Uh, well, Ferguson Castle was built uh, in 1911. That's how we uh, were able to do that. I mean, I was surprised when I looked at it. I wondered what that big building was across the way until I, I stood out on the mill and I, and that's the direction you look straight out and there you would have seen Ferguson Castle. It was torn down in the 70s. Yeah, when was Ferguson Castle. Yeah, in the early 70s, it was, it was built by the uh, Julia Ferguson, who was, who was born, I think, uh, an armor, wasn't she? A meat pack or yes, armor, armor meat packing. Yeah, uh, and it was their money, and uh, it's again one of the great losses of the historic building in Huntington. It really didn't stand that long, uh, but we do have some good pictures of it, and maybe someday we'll do a talk on the Ferguson Castle. <laughs> And uh, Tracy has put up on the chat the link to the video on uh, the, the Mount Vernon grist mill. And it's it's very good video to get an understanding of how the process worked when you see it in action. And what's very interesting, you'll recognize a lot of the gears you saw from the Ben, I'm not gonna say it, the Lefferts mill. Uh, <laughs> white, the Lefferts it's white. Mill. They have the same gears, but they're brand new. We have the 200 year old version. They look like they were copied from our gears. Yes. All right, that looks like the end of our questions. So thank you everyone so, so much. And thank you to our speakers. I hope you